You're listening to the Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. I'm here tonight with Rick and Paul. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm doing all right, thank you, all things considering. <laughs> I'm doing absolutely lovely, thanks for asking, dear. Ah, excellent. So uh, I'd like to introduce a guest that actually needs no introduction, but I'm going to provide one anyways. Uh, our guest has been making games since about 1982 and has been a part of my life personally since 1984, teaching me to be entrepreneurial with Donald Duck and later teaching me how to spell prophylactic with Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> As my education continued, I learned to problem solve gamble in Larry's casino, and eventually even mix pharmaceuticals with Freddie Farkas, not to mention the plethora of other games he has been involved with that so many of us enjoy. I'd like to introduce to you all today, Al Lowe. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a very nice introduction. <laughs> you, you know, you could have just typed rubber. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. Well, now you tell me. Now you're going to tell me there's a way to bypass the uh, questions at the beginning of the game, too. Yeah, that's Alt X. <laughs> Darn it! <laughs> oh my god, I could have been playing it this entire time. I thought the bypass was just Google. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on when you started playing. When I was about nine years old, the bypass was "Hey, Dad," which, luckily, he was the kind of dad that accommodated. Why are you asking me questions about Spiro Agnew? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it's great to have you on. I'm really excited. Now, uh, maybe uh, most of you probably don't know, but uh, the Classic Gamers Guild has actually had the opportunity to meet with Al Lowe the few times in Seattle, uh, going to PAX and maybe partying it up a little bit, telling stories. And uh, this year, we're going to keep it a bit more low-key. The uh, Classic Gamers Guild is going to hang out with you in a virtual format, which I think everybody will be excited about because they get to participate in our conversations. That's great. I'm looking forward to it. So uh, uh, where did you grow up anyways? I've heard a lot about the games, but I, I haven't heard a lot about you. Uh, did you have siblings? Did you have a big family, a small family? Um. I was born and raised in Gumbo, Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, at the time, it was a small community, maybe 200 people, um, and is now the site of a large airport mm -hmm. uh, just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. So I was mostly a country boy who was always interested in geeky stuff. I was a, a, a proto nerd, I guess, you know, back before the term was out. But mm -hmm. I was the kid in grade school who jumped up to fix the film projector. <laughs> I, I was the kid who resoldered the microphone cables and, and uh, <laughs> set up this. I built speaker systems and uh, uh, I, 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 all that stuff. I, you know, back in the uh, back in those old days. So uh, I was always interested in electronics and and. Um, uh, gadgets and uh, things. And when computers first came out, I remember thinking that um, I just had to have one of these. I didn't know why or what I'd do with it, but um, it just seemed like the future and I wanted to be a part of it. I that was raised an only child. I had an older sister who was 13 years older, but by the time I was in grade school, she was grown and married. Mm -hmm. So I was essentially a, an only child with uh, older parents. Uh, I was um, born when my father and mother were 45 years old. So I was an afterthought in their lives. So I, I had a lot of advantages. Uh, they were not financially well off, but they were certainly established. You know, they had their life together. And, and um, so I enjoyed, a, I think, a great upbringing. I was very happy. And, and um, my older sister was always close with me. And and the first part of my life, she was the built-in babysitter, you know. She was the <laughs> kind of surrogate mother. Uh, and, and then we remained close over the years. So that, that's my family story. Um, I, I decided to 
because of all these different interests that I had, I was active in high school and a lot of different things, but music has always been a strong part of my life. And I mm -hmm. lived um, in an area that had uh, access to a lot of music. And, and my parents uh, were very supportive in that um, uh, they would take me to, before I could drive, of course, they would take me to band rehearsals and to uh, practices and, and gigs, eventually to gigs. I started playing professionally when I was 13 and um, never had a high school job or a college job to speak of, always made my money playing music. Um, mm -hmm. And back then, it was it was an odd time. You could actually make a living as a musician, as opposed to <laughs> now, where everybody just downloads the, whatever they want. <laughs> so that, that's my that's my childhood story. I like that. And so you went to school. And when you were going to school, you went specifically to become a teacher. Did you think you would have ever been anything else? I, I think you worked with a band, but did you know you'd be a teacher? Oh yeah, I I, yeah. I went to college with the intent to be involved in music, mm -hmm. um, and I quickly uh, learned in my freshman year that musicians mostly starved, and it was <laughs> far better to uh, uh, have a safe career to fall back on. So I I switched, I quickly switched to um, uh, a teaching. Uh, major and uh, got my bachelor's degree and then within a year got my master's degree in music education. So always with the goal of becoming a, um, a high school band director, orchestra director, mm -hmm. um, uh, and eventually jazz band, uh, marching band, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I've heard a little bit about how you created a program before you even had your own home computer to do work with marching band formations. Could you maybe tell me a little bit about that? Well, it wasn't with marching band formations. That was the that was one I wanted to be able to create, but uh, I couldn't. I, I didn't. Mm. I, I was unable to. Uh, it required too much graphics processing power and too much. So, but what I did create, I, I was working in the field as a um, music coordinator, and so I created. Uh, a lot of music festivals. We had a marching band mm. festival and a concert band festival and a jazz festival. And my wife had choir festivals and chorus competitions. And we made all of them uh, competitive so that the choirs would get ranked from best mm. to worst. They would get scores by several judges and the scores would be added and averaged. And, uh, and it was the perfect uh, math job for a computer. So I went to the uh, local school district uh, that employed me, and I said to the computer guy, hey, this would be a perfect job for a computer. And he laughed at me and said, yeah, we'll get to that in about 20 years. Um, <laughs> so he's, But it, it, something happened, and he said, you know, we've got a basic programming manual, and nobody, no real man would ever use basic. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say it that way, but that was what he meant. <laughs> And uh, uh, you can have this manual, and we'll give you an account number and a password. And uh, if you want, you can write your own program. And it was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that because mm -hmm. I know everything about programming. You know, I, <laughs> I had no idea. So my, I, uh, I, my son went to nursery school that fall mm -hmm. and uh, came home and two weeks later had chicken pox. And two mm -hmm. weeks after that, I had chicken pox, <laughs> and I was sick as a dog, man. It was it was terrible. Um, I called up the doctor's office, and I said, this is crazy. I had chicken pox when I was a kid, and the nurse said, I've had it three times. You can have it more than once if you, <laughs> you, know, you got chicken pox, so stay home and stay away from everybody for two weeks. Okay, so I was quarantined, and uh, this now you got to remember this is in the early 80s and uh, we had three maybe four channels on the television um and, uh, none of which was any good during the day <laughs> and um we had books in the house but i'd read them all we had magazines but i'd read them all and you know by the end of the first couple of days i was stir crazy and so there was that big old manual from the basics basic programming manual that the uh, computer guy had given me and uh oh, well hell i'll just read this and i started reading it and it all made sense it was deck basic uh from the you know digital equipment company and uh um it it would make good sense and the more i thought about it the more i thought well i 
I've designed the judging score forms for this contest. I know exactly what uh, input is going to be, and I know exactly what the output's going to be. What if I just sat down and kind of had the computer do the math for me? Hmm. Um, and it was the perfect way to learn to program because I had uh, a, a um, absolutely defined uh, uh, input, and I knew exactly you know, a defined output. And, and um, uh, all I had to do was the processing in between. So uh, by the end of the week, I thought, I could do this. And my wife brought home a um, remote terminal. Hmm. Picture this back in the old days. Big old curved top ADM and uh, hmm. a, an acoustic coupler modem that hmm. had two rubber suction cups. And you <laughs> dialed your phone uh, and then stuck the receiver into those rubber suction cups, and you could talk to the mainframe at a startling 110 baud. Whoa. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> like uh, 10 characters a second. I could type yeah. as fast as this damn <laughs> modem went. But it, it, but it gave me access to the to the mainframe, and I started for a week. I was... You know, with the chicken pox, I was very sick. But by the second week, I was just bored. I, I, you know, I'd recovered, but I was still contagious. I, I, I had, I was under quarantine, and so I had a week of nothing to do except play with this new toy. And um, by the end of that week, I had um, entered most of the uh, formulas needed for the program. And uh, the after that, it was just kind of refining it, and making it simpler. So. In the fall of 1978, we hmm. um, were the first uh, uh, music festival anywhere to use computerized scoring. And, uh, I, and I was very pleased when we got to the actual day of the event, and it actually worked. <laughs> that was <laughs> always a, a pleasant surprise. <laughs> It sounds like we possibly wouldn't have Larry and some of your beloved characters without the chicken pox. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I'm glad you got that. Uh, you know, I am too. And it, and it also got me this beard. If you've ever seen a picture of me, uh, I've had a beard ever since that day, which was uh, well, when my son you know, contaminated me, <laughs> infected me. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, I've had a beard for over four years now because uh, beca because uh, I had chicken pox so bad that I couldn't shave. It was just, you couldn't oh, put your finger right. anywhere on my body that wasn't a pox. It was nasty, man. So I don't recommend it to anybody. Get your vaccines, you fools. Everybody, go get a vaccine if you don't have one. So. We don't recommend it unless you want to become a successful game designer, in which case you may want to seek out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of fascinated uh, with your background in, in music, and I noticed that with most of your games, I think, I believe Sans Freddy that, that you composed on them, and I was just curious, was that, was that something like a requirement of yours? Did you want to be the composer on your games, or was that more of just, you know, extra stress to deal with? It, it um, at the time... A, a programmer was responsible for all aspects of a title. And uh, when I first started, I, hell, I did graphics as well. I did everything. And um, uh, it wasn't until later that teams developed. Um, obviously, most programmers weren't very good at drawing, and so graphics were the first thing that went over. But, but also music was a real afterthought back then, and uh, right. there were no full-time game composers by far or anything else. So so uh, because I had a background in music, it was easy for me to write some little ditties. I mean, you got to remember, uh, the best synthesizer available to us had three voices and a noise channel. So uh, you know, a noise channel being like a snare drum or cymbals or something like that. You know, so you couldn't really do uh, very much. It didn't take a lot to be a composer in those days. It wasn't until MIDI came along that uh, music became a thing in uh, computer games. And that was, what, 86, 87, something like that? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you have to remember that um, we're talking about a very primitive time. Uh, right. The, the early games, the first five years, that, or maybe more, um, that I wrote games, uh, there was no Photoshop. 
<laughs> right, right. The time we did ga- before Photoshop. <laughs> we we created games before there was a Photoshop. I, and you tell that to people now, and they go, "Whoa, how do you do that? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? You can't do that." <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. All those um, uh, adventure games that Sierra did. Um, you know, they all looked a lot alike uh, because we uh, only had the tools that Sierra created uh, in order to make them. Uh, Sierra created a, a graphics editor so that we could create the backgrounds. They created an animation program so we could animate characters. Um, they created a sound effects program and a music program and a font editor we had mm-hmm. to create our own fonts i remember there was a scene where i wanted a, a larger font in larry 2 i think it was and they didn't have a larger font and so i <laughs> i said to somebody can i use the font editor yeah and so i made a big bold font like a i don't know helvetica or something and um yeah, I had to, but I had to make it myself. I had to click pixels until I got letter shapes, and I I think I made I don't think I made lowercase. I think I only made an uppercase alphabet. But uh, yeah, that, it was a primitive time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. We're like, where, where's the drop down menu where I can just select fourteen or sixteen oh, and change my yeah. size? Uh-huh. <laughs> so being the being the resident uh, musician, if you will, at Sierra at the time, were you were you called upon by your peers to to come up with uh, little ideas for for their games? Sure, yeah. At the uh, you know when they found out that I had music skills, uh, you know people called on me. I did the music for Space Quest Two and um, King's Quest Two, and. Um, what else? A, a few other. I mean, until I got more active in designing myself, and games got bigger, suddenly I didn't have the time to do those things. But, uh, but yeah, my and in fact, I was lead programmer on King's Quest Three, and mm-hmm. they asked me to do the music, and I said, oh, I can't do that, and also, you know, get this program out by Christmas, which is <laughs> everybody's goal. Um, so they hired my wife to create the music for um, King's Quest Three. So if you look, you can see Margaret Lowe's music credits, <laughs> and uh, she and she did a good job. The music, I like the music that she did. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. That's great. King's Quest Three is near and dear to many people's hearts. I think because it invoked a lot of emotion. I mean, fear and and wonder and mystery. There, there was a lot going on in that game. Fear of typing. <laughs> <laughs> I argued with Roberta about uh, uh, accepting typos in those spells. You know that, and she said, "Nope. Yes. If there's a, any typo, it's uh, it's wrong, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, they die." <laughs> you know, it's like, "Oh <laughs> man, you, you cut people some slack." But nope, she didn't. <laughs> she stuck with it. So I appreciate it. As a kid who wasn't really good at school in general, I was always really good at English and spelling, and and my teachers would always ask me, and I'd always say, "Oh, I I have a little bit of help at home." <laughs> like I die if I spell things wrong. That's how. <laughs> How in the world did you guys end up making Disney games in the 1980s? And I mean, not not what I would expect. I was I was never really a Disney kid, but a game like Donald Duck's Playground, it was almost like an adventure game. You were you were creating uh, an entrepreneurial environment, and you were going to the store, buying things, making your own change to upgrade a playground at home. I mean, that that was a pretty broad concept for a kids' game, especially Disney. Yeah, what the hell was I thinking? um well let's see how well i'll take the first part of your question first um Mm -hmm. how did we get the rights to the disney characters um the day that i met ken williams was uh, at apple fest of 1990 1982 i think it was 81 maybe and um that was the day that texas instruments quit the business Hmm. now how's this this is a weird start to this story but texas (laughs) instruments thought well we make computer chips therefore we should make a computer and this apple thing is selling and uh what atari was selling we'll we'll make a texas instruments and we'll call it the ti 99 Mm -hmm. and the secret to success 
is to spend as much money as possible on <laughs> celebrity endorsements and licensed properties. So yeah. tax, this is true. So Texas Instruments, this, you, I'm sure there's a Wikipedia article on this. Uh, you, uh, Texas Instruments went out and hired Bill Cosby to be their mm -hmm. spokesman. Now, he was a huge success at this time, not oh, yeah. unlike today, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, he, he was a really big deal, and I'm sure they spent millions. Um, mm -hmm. He was their spokesman, and they hired, uh, they, they bought the rights to Barbie. <laughs> uh, to all the Mattel games, they bought the rights to the Disney characters. They bought, um, I don't know, uh, uh, just a, a lot more, uh, a, a whole lot of, of things, thinking that that was the way that their games would succeed. And by the way, anything that worked on our machine would not run on anybody else's machine. Mm -hmm. So when you got a TI-99, boy, you mm -hmm. had the only you were the only person that had these games. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people didn't really like that. People liked freedom <laughs> of choice and, and, you know, open architecture and all those things that turned out to be true. Well, they didn't see it that way. So uh, quickly, within years, not I mean, just a couple of years, Texas Instruments said, ooh, we're losing millions and millions of dollars. Let's quit. And they, they said, let's, let's get rid of it. And so when Ken Williams heard this, he knew somebody at Texas Instruments and he called him up and he said, you guys own all these rights. What are you going to do with all the Disney right? The rights to the Disney characters? And they said, I don't know. I guess I'll lose money. And he said, well, what if I gave you a little bit of money and you would be out from underneath the contract? And they agreed. So Sierra ended up with the rights to all Disney characters in all home computer software for a song. I mean, it was <laughs> it was dirt cheap. He didn't pay much money at all. Uh, fire sale. So so they uh, so we ended up. Uh, uh, he said to me, he said, "Well, go home and come up with fifty ideas for games." Uh, and bring them back to me next week. <laughs> so uh, I think I ended up with 20. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, um, anyway, we, we looked at all these characters, and Roberta said, well, I'll do an adventure game where you go to space, and we'll mm -hmm. send uh, Mickey Mouse uh, traveling between planets, and mm -hmm. you'll learn all kind of stuff about different planets. And, okay. And uh, um, uh, they, they said to me, do you want to do Winnie the Pooh? And I said, oh, yeah, I love Winnie the Pooh. So I bought all the Winnie Pooh books, uh, A.A. Milne's books, and uh, read them all. And uh, I had, had a wonderful time creating the Winnie the Pooh in the Hundred Acre Woods title. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, somebody else uh, did uh, an, another title. I'm trying to remember what the other one was. There was a Goofy game as well and Goofy's Wordplay or something and several other games. Anyway, uh, 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 from those titles... Um, we we ended up being pretty successful, and they they liked the Winnie the Pooh game, um, and they at that time Disney was coming out with a, a big motion picture feature film, um, a uh, uh, a movie for adults called The Black Cauldron. That's my dog, and um, uh, the Black Cauldron. Uh, they said, "Well, we we liked what you did with Winnie the Pooh. Would you do a Black Cauldron game?" And I said, "Sure." So they uh, flew me down to Hollywood and got me a limo that had a car phone. I had yeah. never seen oh. a car phone. <laughs> and uh, they drove me to the studios and took me uh, down into the uh, 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 Disney archives, mm -hmm. which yeah. sounds so impressive. Now, I had been to the <laughs> National Archives in Washington, D.C., you know, on the mall, or Pennsylvania Avenue, and... Um, uh, you know, giant marble columns out front and a giant marble building. And so when they said, well, you're going to go to the Disney Art, I was picturing something along the lines of a, you know, a somber bank building and so forth. But instead, they took me to a um, two-story office building uh, that kind of looked like a motel of, of the 50s. And, um, and they said, uh, uh, walk down this external staircase that went down into the basement. So I went down into this, you know, basement stairwell, 
and uh, rang the, the bell, and this woman came to the door, and she said, oh, yeah, you're L.O., okay, come on inside. Oh, and the phone started ringing. She said, well, I'm here all alone. Uh, just wait right here, and, and I'll be right back in a second. Let me answer the phone. I've got a, I, so, <laughs> so I'm standing in the doorway of this <laughs> basement hall and uh, waiting, and I kind of lean and put my hand up on the wall, and there was the original pencil drawings to Snow White. Wow. And they had hundreds and thousands of original cells from the, uh, from the films. So she took me to a back room, and there was a table that must have been eight feet square. Uh, I had to be eight feet, eight feet on a side of square table, and it was rounded over with a mountain of uh, 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 boards, uh, uh, poster boards, that had original watercolor drawings on them. So just imagine a mound of original artwork. And I said, what's this? And she said, oh, these are all the backgrounds from the Black Cauldron. And I said, oh, my God. So you have to catalogize all these and file them and everything? She said, oh, no, we'll pull out a few and keep them, and the rest we'll we'll trash. (laughs) And she said, I'm really, hey, I'm dreading next week. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, I get, you know, 280,000 cells uh, uh, celluloid in, and I have to pick, you know, the one percent that we save, and then we'll throw away all the rest. Uh, this is the days before Michael Eisner, <laughs> obviously, yeah. who realized, oh my God, this is a profit center we could be <laughs> selling. So, so that was my experience with the Disney uh, company. They um, uh, they gave me a bunch of uh, original. Uh, drawings from the Black Cauldron, and uh, oh, I said I, I need to have the music. We want to put music in the game, mm-hmm. and they said, "Oh, well, uh, come over here to this shelf." And here was this steel shelf that w- there were folders numbered one to twenty-five, and the first mm-hmm. one was was uh, Steamboat Willie, and, uh, Steamboat <laughs> Mickey, and um, mm-hmm. uh, um, a- and all the way down to the Black Cauldron. Um, all the original scores in the original handwriting of the composers of those wow. films and uh, they let me make uh, uh, xerox copies of the scores and i didn't save it i guess i gave it back to them i should have saved a copy but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway it was, i guess that had been a violation of something but so anyway that uh, that so that's how they ended up with it now the bigger question is why did we get rid of it mm-hmm. at that point in computer games licensed properties didn't sell well um, because I think so many of the characters, like the Barbie games and and the you know different titles, came out and they weren't very good, and so That's people true. just said, "Yeah, we'll we'll just go with the you know the cre- the original creators, the the King's Quests and the and the uh, I don't know other games, you know that that uh, people created originally." And um, so after a couple of years of selling Disney titles, Ken said, "You know." We're doing all the work, and Disney's getting all the profit. Uh, why don't we just make our own games and uh, and give this back? So he gave the rights back to Disney and didn't renew it, the contract. Um, and and so that's how the, um, uh, the 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 Disney characters came and went in the Sierra catalog. That's fascinating. Donald Duck's Playground, back to that just for a moment. I mean, it it was kind of like uh, my first introduction into adventure-style games, being able to walk three-dimensionally, at least to me, around on the screen. Was that an idea that you guys had come up with during the making of the Disney games? Well, yeah. uh, King's Quest came out during the time we had, during the Disney period Mm -hmm. uh, at Sierra. And uh, so once we had the AGI interpreter and uh, Mm -hmm. engine, I guess you'd call it, um, um, then it seemed likely to, to logical to use that um, in in other titles. And so while Winnie the Pooh was written, I think on an Apple II, Mm -hmm. uh, and then I translated to Commodore and Atari and so forth, um, in a year or two, uh, when King's Quest came out, we had this more advanced language, and so we used um, that to uh, that AGI language to create Black Cauldron, and then mm-hmm. from Black Cauldron, 
uh, when they wanted a, a Donald Duck game, I mm-hmm. said, well, we can do this 3D stuff. Well, and, mm-hmm. I, I, and I knew how to do it then because I had to learn on Black Cauldron. You know, mm-hmm. there were, I don't know if people understand how primitive this stuff was, but, <laughs> but AGI uh, as a language, um, uh, uh, AGI stands for Adventure Game Interpreter, and it was literally written to be that. It was an, a, a program that would interpret intermediate code called pseudocode, P code. Uh, it would interpret that P code and uh, pr- 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 play a game back no matter what game it was. So the idea was rather than write a specific game with specific code, we would write this thing that could read uh, game code and play it back. So you wouldn't have to recreate everything every time. You could instead uh, uh, make a compiler that wrote the P code and then have the interpreter read the P code and, pl- and play the game. So that, that's how that whole system game engine worked um but remember we had to create our own graphics background editor and mm-hmm. and uh, animation editor and all that stuff so um so why was that ge- donald duck that way was it, it well i guarantee you it wasn't because of input from the disney corporation <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah that's the, for sure they when this deal came about uh with com- home computers um, nobody at Disney had any inkling of what the hell we were talking about. Uh, and so they had a educational division, an office with a f- some women who had been elementary school teachers, and they were responsible for film strips and workbooks and stuff like that, you know, movie, uh, educational movies, the, that part of Disney. And they said, well, I guess these home computers are kind of like a film strip. You you girls take care of it. <laughs> so, so these poor people, I mean, they, you know, they had no interest. They had no home computers. They had never seen a computer. They didn't know what to do. So they, they pretty much said, oh, okay, whatever you want to do. Um, and then they would come up with suggestions like, oh, I think his, his coat could be a little darker brown. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, that's not how it works. <laughs> Apple's got this color and it doesn't have any of the others, so it's not going to be a little different. It's going to be this or yellow. We could do. We could, <laughs> yeah. I had so, it in amber monochrome. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that you know that that people forget about those days, but my God, the the. Um, just watching it in black and white or green screen, you know, uh, I remember getting an amber monitor was a step up. I had a green it screen. Mm-hmm. It was just a bunch of green dots, man. It was, um, yeah, so anyway, it was a, a different time. Hmm. So why was Donald Duck's Playground the way it was? Because um, I'm interested in model railroads. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah. so there's a railroad switching puzzle mm-hmm. in that there game. Is. And I lived in Fresno, and uh, we flew out of the Fresno airport a lot. And so we were constantly getting our baggage tags confused with other places. And so, <laughs> so there was a baggage sorting game. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and Fresno is in the, the heart of the agricultural fruit and a growing mm-hmm. region, and uh, uh, so there was a uh, uh, agricultural Fruit. melon <laughs> products. <laughs> I was so good at that so, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the best. And you got to understand, I was working in a language that was geared to be um, um, uh, uh, for adventure titles. It was written mm-hmm. specifically to create King's Quest. Mm-hmm. and uh, games like that where you move around. So it wasn't really set up as an arcade game. Uh, for example, um, I, I wanted you to be able to earn money mm-hmm. and spend money. And I had to have a way to display money. Mm-hmm. So this is how primitive the language was. I asked the guy who was in charge of the language at Sierra, would you please give me a print handling statement where I could say... Um, you know, there's a, a six thousand cents uh, in this guy's account. I want to. I have a variable for six thousand. Can you um, uh, print that on the screen as so many dollars and cents? 
-hmm. And he said, no. He said, just use if statements. So I wrote, I had to store how many cents you had and how many tens and how many dollars and how many tens of dollars, all in separate variables because he wouldn't give me two-digit numbers. I could only go up to 255, and I knew you'd be able to, you know, at some point make more. So I um, ended up writing a print statement that said at the top of the screen, if he has $1, print a 1. If he has $2, print a 2. Just the stupidest, I mean, literally dumbest form of programming possible. Ten <laughs> nested if statements. Uh, and that was for each digit of the number. And then when he saw the game finished and uh, saw what I was doing, he said, well, why didn't you tell me? I could have just, it would have taken me five minutes to make up. A... You son of a bitch. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yes, uh, yeah, it, it was different. I, I never was big on the educational games. That and, and Tapper and the Ancient Art of War and Karatika, that was kind of all of my lead-ups into uh, King's Quest IV, which I believe you had a, a bit of a hand in yourself. I was the cavalry in King's Quest IV. If you look at the opening credits of that game, um, there it says programmed by two guys, and then it says cavalry coding by, and it lists about seventeen other people, <laughs> and um, and that was our way of acknowledging what happened on that project. Sierra was busily uh, wanting to go public. Uh, their 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 goal was to go public in the in uh, the fall of eighty seven whatever year King's Quest four came on. Um, uh, they wanted to go public and, and um, they promised all the, all the, the when you go public you go around the country to various investors uh, and, and um, offices and things and presented what's called a dog and pony show where you tell people hey we got this new company and um and it's in this new market that nobody's ever heard of and none of you know how to use computers and stuff but it's a big thing with your kids your kids will like it and um uh um uh, uh, we've got this new product coming out that's going to revolutionize the business and it'll deal in higher resolution graphics and it'll be able to eventually run CD-ROMs, which nobody ever heard of. And, and um, uh, it'll have uh, more colors and more animation and more memory and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, and uh, it's going to be the greatest thing going. And so the f management was worried about all the th aspects of going public. Nobody was worried about the game itself. Roberta had designed it, and she would go and look at the guys who programmed it and talk with them. And, and do you have any questions? No, everything's going great. Well, how come I can't see this? Well, this that's coming, or we haven't got that done yet. Or blah, blah, blah. And so the two guys gave her lots of stories until finally in August she said, I don't think this game's going to make it. Can you have somebody take a look at it? So they called me up, and they said, would you go look at this game? and give us your honest assessment of whether it's going to be able to ship in a month. And I looked at it and I said, "There's this game's not going to ship in a year. These two guys are totally lost. They have no idea what they're doing. And um, and they're, they're not willing to admit um, that they don't know and ask questions and, and ask for help. So Ken called a meeting of the company one labor, I was on Labor Day, I remember vividly, um, early September, and uh, all the programmers in the company got together, oh, and all the artists, come to think of it, I think they got everybody in the conference room and said, mm -hmm. um, this game's got to ship by the end of the month. September 30th is the deadline, and uh, we're going to take we're going to close all other projects, and everybody in the company is going to work on King's Quest Four. And Al, you're in charge. And uh, <laughs> so it was it was like holy cow. So we brought in I think it was 15 programmers, something like that. Wow. Um, and all the artists that you have to remember. We had uh, so few artists because nobody knew how to use the tools. I mean, it was one thing to say nobody knew how to draw uh, on a computer because that 
nobody knew that. That just didn't happen then. There was no Photoshop. There was no drawing programs. You know, there was one kid out of a hundred that might have touched a, a, a mouse. It's just, it's crazy to, you know, there were people that knew how to draw, but they didn't know how to use the programs that we had written to make stuff. So it was a real tough time. Everybody pitched in, and we had uh, daily meetings, and I would assign um, this scene to this person and this scene to this person, and everybody had a small little piece of it, and my job was to make sure it all fit together and worked at one time. And and uh, our basic plan was that... Uh, Everyone would work around the clock, 24 hours a day, uh, until you dropped over and fell over. And then you would go <laughs> sleep at this motel that was next door. And we had rooms rented by continuously, but they the, we had a deal with them that they would change the sheets. So when a guy would go to bed he'd, at, at 4 in the morning... He would sleep until two in the afternoon or something. They'd change the sheets and somebody else would fall down and sleep from three in the <laughs> afternoon until 10. And they'd change the sheets and somebody would come in at 10 and sleep. It was just, we literally shared bunks <laughs> uh, around the clock. And um, it, it rolled into a pattern of we would program all day and night. And then in the, about five in the morning or four in the morning, um, we would do a build of the game and and then make copies of that. And then by 5 a.m., the QA staff would come in and they would uh, test start testing. And then they would list up, you know, hundreds of bugs on paper, by the way, because nobody had bug testing software. There was no, there was no, you know, any kind of ma bug management system. No, we didn't have, no, you'd just write up a piece of paper. So I would come in and I would sleep until 10 a.m. or something. I'd come in at 10 and we'd have a meeting and I would go through and well, we found these bugs, this bug, and this. I'd throw all these papers at every programmer and then they would work all day and night to fix those bugs and then finish the next scene that they were supposed to do um wow. it was a, a amazing time and we didn't make it we we mm. shipped we shipped on september 31st oh, <laughs> <so> <laughs> because sierra had a deal with um I think software, et cetera, or one of the big software chains that the game would ship in September. And we got down to the wire, and I, I said to the <laughs> manager, the, market, the man, manufacturing manager, we're not going to make it. We just can't get it done today. And, uh, and he said, oh, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. And so yeah, we got uh, a f a f he got enough a few thousand boxes made to satisfy this contract, and he dated it September 31st. <laughs> and that's the honest to God's truth. Wow. <laughs> so he got it into the store. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was... Um, it was buggy as hell, but um, uh, but at least you know we got it done, and then we fixed bugs for a week after that, I and then for did. another two weeks or so, uh, there was still a team cleaning things up and and repairing you know obscure kind of problems and stuff. But it was uh, it was a hell of a project. Goodness, Cavalry coding. <laughs> Speaking of of calling in the cavalry or, or saving the day, could you could you tell us a little bit about your role in Police Quest One? <laughs> well, <laughs> Police Quest One was uh, started um, long before Leisure Suit Larry One, and um, the they had one programmer and Jim Walls and an artist. Uh, and, and they worked for a year, and in the meantime, I had uh, written Larry and shipped it and uh, uh, <laughs> realized it wasn't going to make me any money because it was a terrible <laughs> seller. It uh, didn't sell well at all the first month, and uh, so they said, well, the King's Quest guys need help. Can you help them? So I uh, uh, moved into a house in Oakhurst uh, with... Uh, and we literally lived together, uh, Jim Walls and and um, Greg Norman, Greg Rowland, and I, uh, and um, uh, we just worked round the clock uh, that summer and uh, fall, and uh, got Police Quest One to ship in time for Christmas. I was very proud of that. But, but uh, Police Quest was in pretty rough shape when I got to it. Jim was a storyteller; mm -hmm. he was a, mm -hmm. a police 
uh, 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 high, uh, what do you call it? California Highway Patrol, CHIPS. Remember CHIPS? Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a mm-hmm. California yeah. Highway Patrolman. And his writing style uh, was kind of um, uh, police reports. So if you've ever read a police report, you know, that was his style of writing. Uh, and his had never played a game. He thought that uh, writing a game meant you, t- you wrote a story. So that's what he did. He wrote a story, <laughs> and Greg programmed it. And um, when I got to the project, you, you could go into a scene, and if you knew exactly what you were looking for, you could type that in, and it would say, you got that thing or whatever it is, and <laughs> then you would go out and do it. And, and, but there were no clues. There was no auxiliary material and and i say well jim how is anybody supposed to know that you're supposed to walk around the car before you get into it and he said well that's just standard police training (laughs) (laughs) yes but (laughs) so my job besides you know some some of the programming stuff consisted of fleshing out the game so that that there was more than one path that you could walk through it it it, it in essence when i got to it you, if you knew everything that was in jim wall's head you could get through the game and and and, <laughs> uh, and play it but if you made one mistake it would kill you and you had no idea why <laughs> Uh, his error messages throughout the game, it was always the same. You're blowing it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, Jim, that's not really helpful at this point. How? how <laughs> so we went through a lot of, oh, well, oh, you, you could say this and that. And then, you know, we would program that stuff. So, so yeah, but, uh, oh, my God, we had a we had a great time. Jim's a wonderful storyteller and a, and a great personality and fun to be with. And and um, uh, we we laughed a lot during the development. It's not a funny game, but we laughed a lot at it. Um, that uh, but driving those cars, oh, that was so unforgiving. And I kept, I kept telling, I said, well, well, why don't you make it easier? Why don't you make it so that, you know, if you press the up arrow and uh, you can make a turn at the next junction. Nope. If you press the right arrow one pixel too early, you crash. And I was like, oh, shit, this isn't fun. But anyway, that was, uh, so later on in some game, Larry 3, I think, I, uh, I had a scene at the end of the game where you, came down uh oh you you went in backstage at sierra and they were working on police Love quest that. uh mm-hmm. and that was my homage to jim walls working with him on that project <laughs> <laughs> i want to hear a little bit more about uh, leisure suit larry three and and the bamboo forest i know i know you had a little bit of fun with that and and uh i'd like to hear about it <sighs> i was on an airplane flying to Germany and to publicize Larry 2, which um, is kind of odd because Sierra never did any sales or marketing or spent any money um, advertising my games. It was all word of mouth. But they did uh, uh, have people in Europe who had money and they said well we'll fly him over and let him do interviews with magazines and so forth and newspapers and we'll get publicity that way and so i said wow that sounds great so i did a lot of touring to promote the games but um they didn't do a lot of uh, spending of money (laughs) for that kind of stuff i was on an airplane and i thought how could i do a maze in a game we had just recently gotten the ability to reverse uh, animations on the fly so that we could put up a, um, a static scene and and uh, flip it, uh, I think, both left and right and up and down, which, you know, it was a simple, uh, a simple matter of literally reading through the data backwards. I'm sure that's how he did it. Uh, he being the uh, Jeff Stevens and the the uh, lead programmer on the engine. Uh, but anyway, he did a, a thing where you could reverse an image, and uh, and I thought, boy, it would be fun to do a maze uh, <laughs> that uh, 
didn't have to load from the disk. It would be all resonant because one of the bugaboos back then was loading um, yes. files from the <laughs> floppy disk. It just took forever. Mm-hmm. And so if you were in a maze and you wanted to go from one scene to the next, oh, God, it would have to load that whole image off the disk and load the, the mm-hmm. um, others, and, and it took forever. And so I thought, what if I just kept the image in memory and flipped it uh, internally and then had four, I had two paths that crossed, one that went east to west and one that went north to south. Uh, and then I had the artist draw up extra bamboo in the forest to uh, block those four exits. So then I had uh, I created a grid of, I think it was 64, uh, eight, I think it was eight by eight. I'm not sure. It's been a long time, but I, mm-hmm. uh, like a, I think it was a checker chessboard, you know, a chessboard, eight by eight. And I assigned a path through there, but all 64 of those scenes were the same image, except I would block one or two or maybe three of the openings <laughs> in that path. So it looked like you couldn't go that way. Uh, and, um, and so I, then I thought, well, how could I store this most efficiently? I can't mm-hmm. use the engine to do it because it'll try and load a fresh scene every time. Uh, how can I do it myself? And so I, uh, um, I got 64 uh, bits, which would be eight bytes, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got eight bytes of memory um, and assigned those to the... Um, uh, one bit to each uh, uh, square on the checkerboard, um, and that uh, I had a north, south, uh, east, and west, and then I had a um, uh, another one for the direction of the image, so it was north, uh, it was right or flipped or reversed. So anyway, in uh, about 150 or so, what would that be, 150 bytes, maybe? I stored uh, uh, thousands of uh, combinations <laughs> there. And, uh, and I don't know that anybody ever caught on, but I was proud of the hack. I thought I was, it, was, it was a cool hack on my part. <laughs> I don't know that anybody ever noticed or cared, but it was something else. And oddly enough, 20 years later, or so, 15 years later, I ended up using the same technology um, during the dot-com boom. Um, There was a company in uh, Seattle here that was looking for a VP of technology, and they called me in. They said, we need to, uh, we want to create this web app that, uh, uh, well, it wasn't an app then. It was a website, (laughs) of course. Uh, This was 1999. that would uh, enable people to make appointments. Well, so if you're going to make an appointment, you need to know what times of day you can schedule. And so we said, well, how how can we do that? And the, they had a database manager person who was used to dealing with huge databases. And, and the response was, well, we'll just feed, you know, every long list of every time that's available um, and, uh, so if there's a time slot from 1215 to 1230, we'll send one, two, uh, one, five, and then one, two, three, zero. And then <laughs> you'll know that those, that's, uh, so that would be nine bytes for one time slot. And, uh, um, this was the time of 1200 baud modem. So, you know, it was not you couldn't really transfer that much data. So I started thinking about it and I said, well, what if we assigned every five minutes to be a bit and there would be 12 bits in an hour. So Mm -hmm. you could signal if, if you had from, uh, 1215 to 1230 open, you would, uh, have the first three, was first three or four bits toggled, and then the, the twelve thirty, the one for twelve fifteen, the one for twelve twenty, and the twelve <laughs> would be untoggled. They would be zeros. So in a matter of one byte, you could, or uh, actually, uh, I think it got down when you do the math, it was uh, just a little over one kilobyte. I could tell you an entire month's availability of calendar. Wow. Yeah, and and uh, oh my gosh, it was. uh, But it was all came back from being able to program, you know, dots and dashes on Donald Duck's playground, and 
<laughs> and uh, I love it. bits of maze <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah. Patty. Solving a solving a real life puzzle with adventure game logic. That's yep, brilliant. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I've got one more question for you, and then we'll hand it over to Rick for the mailbag so you can get on with your day. Um, I was wondering if you could give us like one behind-the-scenes story that stands out to you as particularly humorous or endearing or whatever from your time at Sierra. Well, gosh. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, <sighs> God, I can't give you one. I mean, there were thousands of, mm. you know, weird, funny, odd things that happened. Um, Perhaps you could just uh, quickly write a the, novel for me. I can me. tell you, I can tell you <laughs> a, I can tell you one really interesting thing that happened because of Larry and, mm. and because of gaming. And, and I don't know that I've shared this story particularly, but um, <laughs> when, Larry was ready to ship. They, uh, um, I had used his last name a few times in the game, and uh, I had used the name of a guy who worked at Sierra. Uh, his name wasn't Larry, but I used his last name, and it was kind of an inside joke uh, because <laughs> he was kind of Larry-ish. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, it was funny to all of us, and it wouldn't hurt anybody else. Well, just before the game shipped, John Williams called me and said, uh, Al, you better change that guy's name because he quit the company this morning, and I'm afraid he might sue us and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, shit, okay. So I, what am I going to do for a last name? Well, La Land of the Lounge Lizards was the title of the game. And I thought, well, maybe Larry should have an alliterative last name as well. So I, my wife and I had just bought an Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember those things? They, oh, yeah. It was, oh, they were yeah. called books. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I grabbed volume L out of the, the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I started paging through from the very beginning. And one of the first images I saw was a photograph. Actually, it was a line, a woodcut line drawing of Arthur B. Laffer. Huh. Now... <laughs> I'm sure your listeners aren't familiar with the name Arthur B. Laffer, but uh, in the early 80s, he was a big deal because he convinced Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, that trickle-down economics was a great idea. Oh, he yeah. invented a thing called the Laffer Curve, which said mm -hmm. if you give rich people lots of money, they'll spend it on poor people, which I think we've all... <laughs> have demonstrated <laughs> over the years <laughs> to be a big mistake. But at the time, uh, Arthur B. Laffer was a huge economist. He went around the world um, uh, teaching people how, you know, how to run banks and how to run their country's currencies and things. I mean, he was a big deal. And I thought, what better name for a comic character than Laffer? <laughs> you know, it sounds like laughter. It sounds like, yeah. And so that's how Larry got his last name was because of Arthur B. Laffer. So in about 1990 or so, uh, we had a idea for a project that wasn't an adventure game, but it was rather a collection of utility programs that you could use uh, just for fun, just funny stuff. Uh, but instead of it being helpful and useful, uh, <laughs> it'll be ways to screw around at the office. And remember, a lot of our customers were office people because they didn't have home computers. Mm -hmm. So the guys in marketing said, what, what can we do to um, uh, do this? And somebody said, well, Arthur B. Laffer was big on productivity, and he, he cannot, he's an economist, perhaps he would write us an insult non-endorsement. And then we could put his picture on the box and, and uh, you know, okay. <laughs> so they called Laffer's office and uh, said, um, this is uh, John Williams from Sierra Online, and we have this new uh, product that we're putting out, and we'd like you to write an insulting, uh, we'd like you to write an insult about it. Or, and if you don't have anything, we can insult. We can write insults for you, and you can pick one. And his secretary said, "Okay, well, I'll tell him." And so she, I learned the story later. She went into him, and and he said, 
what what what's a what's a home computer <laughs> what, who has a computer in their house and uh wh- wait why would you no why who would want no i don't what's a sierra what and she her son had played leisure suit larry and she said sir i think you should look at this because i think there's something here the you know our my son's friends and he loved these games and uh, i think this is an up-and-coming business and well he was also an investor he liked to get in you know early on and do angel investing and so he called back and said yeah i'll, I'll come take a look let me say so he flew up to fresno and um wanted to take a tour of the of the company and so forth well ken williams was busy with something else that day and i had just bought a new lexus and so he, I lived in Fresno by the airport. So he said, Al, would you mind picking him up and driving him around for a day? And I said, sure, yeah, I'll do that. So I spent a day with Arthur B. Laffer, this <laughs> wow. uh, uh, guy who <laughs> was uh, <laughs> who helped ruin our uh, economy, um, uh, and uh, took him around and uh, to see if he wanted to invest in Sierra. And, uh, uh, you know, tr- sure enough, he chose not to. And um, yeah, he could have made a hell of a lot of money, but uh, but he didn't. And anyway, that's the that's the Arthur B. Laffer story. That's great. <laughs> well, I think uh, Rick, you you have a few extra questions from some people in the Classic Gamers Guild. Yeah. So there's the uh, so obviously a lot of people in the Classic Gamers Guild are big fans of yours. So I uh, put it out there that they can ask you some questions via our mailbag. Uh, I got a few here. We'll see if we can get through some of these, but they're just sort of uh, short form questions here. Uh, the first one is from Daniel Kennerly Rowe. Uh, is there a joke that you tried to put into a Leisure Suit Larry game that was so lewd and crude it got 86 by the higher ups? No. Really? Because before I put questionable content uh, in my games, <laughs> I ran it by my wife first. Oh. <laughs> That's so I say, Margaret, what do you think about... And if she went, oh my God, then I would not put an in. <laughs> and, if she, and if she said, oh, I don't know, and then I would put it in. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, this one comes from Nalani Briscoe. Uh, I know Torrance Passage was supposed to have a sequel. What was the story plot going to be for that? Well, uh, I originally, let's see. Um, uh, Torrance Passage was designed uh, specifically because Ken Williams wanted a product uh, that was family oriented um, for the years when there was no King's Quest. Mm. You know, at first, games were about a year, took about a year to develop, and then King's Quest took about two years to develop. And so mm. Ken wanted a game for the Christmases without a King's Quest. And he said, can you do that? And I said, you know, that would be fun instead of doing a, um, uh, you know, the adult titles like I've been doing uh, to, uh, to do something that uh, uh, would be playable by a family. And that was about the same time that I went to see Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> uh, and so I noticed during Mrs. Doubtfire that uh, there were two pitches of laughter that when Robin Williams would do something, you know, really silly and slapstick, there would be this yee from all the kids in the audience, you know, this high-pitched yeah. <laughs> little laughter. And then whenever he would say some really dirty double entendre <laughs> that they didn't get, there would be all this <laughs> <laughs> from the adults in the audience. And I thought, you know, why aren't there games like that? Why aren't there games where an adult could play with a kid and, you know, the adult would get a lot of the stu- jokes, but there'd be things that the kid would also laugh at that the, you know, that, and anyway, so I, I wanted to, I said, well, let me create a game where, that had two levels of comedy that had a real slapstick thing that even little kids could enjoy and uh, uh, maybe a higher plane of humor that uh, for the adults. And that's how Torrance Passage came about. So when Ken said to do this, I said, well, what I, sh- I knew that King's Quest was sequels and he had talked about, you know, doing a series of these every other year. 
And so I planned out five games. I plotted this kid's life from um, uh, being raised as an orphan child to becoming a uh, uh, prince, uh, mm-hmm. earning the kingdom, and eventually have a challenge to his authority and, uh, uh, and a... Um, uh, gr- growing old and and dying and literally five I had a five game storyline plotted out in my head and uh, I, I wrote the game with the full intention that that part two would uh, be coming out soon and I didn't have to explain everything that was in part one um, but I didn't take into account the fact that uh, uh, the game market changed horribly when mm. Sierra was taken over by criminals. <laughs> and um um uh, you know the company was stolen mm-hmm. from Ken in a hostile takeover um and uh these guys that are now in f- or uh, that ended up going to federal penitentiary um stole the company and ruined it mm-hmm. uh Obviously, I didn't know any of that at the time, or I would have made the plot line more clear <laughs> to Torres' <Jorah's laughs> message. <laughs> I also would have uh, sold off a lot of my investment in the company <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> had I known. Mm. But, but um, yeah, that was a uh, that was a sad period in the in the third. But anyway, the the the, the um, uh, Torrens eventually was uh, uh, going to um, uh, have a challenge to his authority, or become king, and have a challenge, and and uh, you know grow old and and die during the course of five games. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, this next question is from Martin Van Grinsven. Um, no, not Martin. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, Martin. What Larry game is your favorite, and what non-Larry adventure game is your favorite? Well, Larry Seven um, mm. is, is my favorite. I, I think mm-hmm. primarily because by the time I got to Larry Seven, I felt like I finally knew how to write an adventure game. Mm-hmm. Uh, before that, I was experimenting and trying to figure things out and uh, uh, hoping nobody would notice that I had no clue what the hell was doing. I was doing. <laughs> and um, uh, But by the time I got to Larry Seven, I thought, I, I know how to do this now. And I also had a wonderful team. They all had experience. Um, and they were all uh, the programmers were better programmers than I was. Um, the musician was great. The the uh, uh, composer was a, a noted jazz artist, and uh, um, just everything about the game was just uh, at a level that I was very proud of. So it was. Uh, uh, it would have to be Larry Seven. Uh, I think my favorite other game probably would be Loom. Mm, um, good one. Good which call. is an old, old game. But mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, if you haven't played it, uh, you could do far worse than to dig up a copy someplace. I, I don't know. Where is it? Ava- is it available someplace? Oh, yeah. It's available on uh, GOG and Steam. Yeah. It's pretty, yeah, I would pretty think easy so. now. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what a great game. And partly that's because I'm a musician. I have a soft spot in my yeah. heart uh, for, <laughs> that, for that story. But All right. So the next question is from Christian Sirer. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but there you go. Um, what do you think of the latest Leisure Suit Larry game, Wet Dreams Don't Dry, made by a German team? And do you think it captures the spirit of the originals? I, I love their um, intentions. I thought they had the right intentions. I thought they had a terribly difficult um, project, a, a difficult goal, because mm. what they what they wanted to do was to do a Larry kind of game in the current climate. And um, Larry was a product of its time. Mm -hmm. You know, he was of the eighties. I mean, well, (laughs) he was of the seventies, but, (laughs) but I mean, you know, the story and the game itself was, was uh, uh, timely. And to bring that into the current time, I didn't even try. When we did uh, Leisure Suit Larry Reloaded in, was that 2013, I'm thinking? Mm, yeah. 2012. Mm, um, uh, we didn't even try. We said, nope, it's going to be set in the 80s. He's going to stay in the 80s, and we'll have mm. some 
you know, inside jokes about things that will happen in the future, maybe, or something, you know, but, 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 um, uh, but we didn't even try to bring him up to date. They tried to bring him up to date, and their method was to have him be in a time capsule and come out, and, and now he's uh, a guy in the teens who's of the 70s. Right. And man, that's a long stretch, you know. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. they they had a, a huge challenge, um, uh, but I thought they they it it came pretty close, you know. Uh, mm. um, uh, it, it what I really wished was when they they asked me to endorse the game, mm-hmm. and I chose not to because uh, at, when I played it, the more I played it, the more I thought, oh my God, this could be so much better. You know, I could, mm-hmm. we could do so much more. And I said, I'll tell you what, if you have time, I will help you. I'll consult on it, but, um, I don't think I can endorse it you know, per se. And, um, and they chose not to. So yeah, that's the mm-hmm. way it goes. But, but I, I think, you know, their premise was good. And, and, um, uh, and, and I thought they came the closest of the three yes. post, post me period. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is that a phrase? <laughs> um, and uh, last question here is from Ryan Levitt. Uh, if you could go back and change one thing about the early games of the series, what would you change and why? Oh, well, um, I, I, I was always unhappy with Larry one because I didn't create the puzzles. Mm-hmm. I, you know, uh, uh, Ken had um, a huge selling game back in the early 80s called Softborn. It was the only game that Sierra published that had no graphics. And it was a huge hit. Uh, so when he asked me to do an update to it, I looked at it and said, oh, man, this game is so out of touch. It doesn't have a protagonist. It doesn't have uh, any sorts of clues, particularly. It's a really difficult um, game to figure out. It talks about you in a, a strange sense. Um, uh, in you know, Instead of having Larry do things on screen, it, the game would say, I am your puppet master. Uh, I will do whatever th- the demands. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. It was like, yeah. So I threw away all the text, uh, but I kept the scenes. I kept the setting and the puzzles. And uh, there were some puzzles that I just really wished that I had uh, uh, not kept <laughs> and come up with something better <laughs> instead. Uh, there were some there were some obscure uh, uh, puzzles that were pretty difficult, but um, once they were in, I I kept them in. So, uh, so this is actually one not from the mailbag. It's just something that popped into my head because it's a question I've been having for a little bit. Um, so the famous picture of Eve from Leisure Suit Larry One, which is the um, the final woman that uh, Larry finally manages to seduce. Uh, sitting in the hot tub there. Very strikingly similar pose as Roberta Williams, who is posing in the Soft Porn Adventures cover. So (laughs) is it fair to say that Eve is Roberta Williams? (laughs) No, but it's fair to say that Mark Crow used whatever images he could come up with. (laughs) No, I think Mark did an amazing job to... um, Particularly for the limited amount of color. Remember, we only had sixteen colors. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for the for the limited colors and the resolution, I think it was really light. Yeah, you know, it was um, it was very uh, low resolution, and I thought he did a tremendous job coming up with those. Oh yeah, the uh, the graphics from that era, the AGI era, are actually uh, some. I think just like the most striking, like in in my opinion, like a lot of the most beautiful, like a lot of the uh, graphics and scenery in Police Quest. Um, were fantastic, and uh, Leisure Suit Larry, the the portraits of the women are just. Um, it, it, there's just something about that particular style that mm-hmm. just, yeah, even as graphics got technically better, just didn't really capture quite the same uh, look and feel. It, it's that damn uncanny valley. Mm, yeah. You know, the closer mm-hmm. we get, the farther away it looks. Absolutely. The, uh, um, you know, the, the, it's it just gets creepier. 
at, yeah. at some point, you know? <laughs> it you does, can, yeah. So I think that's one reason anime is so popular, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Um, what? It's only been five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's only fair to let you go. I, I know you've, you've got to go dig up them, them Larry Four discs that you lost somewhere. So <laughs> we'll let you... <laughs> that you get on with that, but but make you, your, you know, your... hey, you you we talked about the laugher utilities. Um, very few people know that that game, the laugher utilities. The title was the, the laugher utilities version 4.0. Mm. Oh. That was my oh, that yeah. was my Larry Four. That joke. was Larry Four. Well, it, it was wasn't. Like, it wasn't well, really, really, but it was. But, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I thought that was funny to add that to the Yeah. Mix. yeah. Oh, that's great. That's that's like learning the secret of Monkey Island at the end of the episode. Yeah, we finally understand. Well, well can 42. we just consider it Leisure Slurry 4 just because everyone's been wanting to put that to rest? Yeah, that's that that, that would be fine. You know, Larry 4 was going Wow, well, you we're wrapping. We shouldn't I shouldn't start. Oh, no, no, we story. have we have time for one more. Well, Larry 4 was going to be an interactive multiplayer adventure game. Oh man! Oh we, wow! In, yeah, we uh, uh, Ken had this idea. Oh gosh, uh, he, he he had his mother or grandma. I think his grandmother um, liked to play bridge uh, and play games, and he wanted to have a way that you could play games online with other people. Mm. And so he came up with this whole uh, Sierra network, it became. Um, it originally started out as Constant Companion. Mm. So it was any time of the day or night, you could go online and find somebody else to play games with. Mm -hmm. uh, interact, you know, but uh, multiplayer games. And so in that mold, he said, well, why don't you do an adventure game that is multiplayer? Now, this was 1989, 90, maybe 1990. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what we envisioned, what we wanted to do was essentially like Ultima Online. Uh, but we were 10 years too early. I mean, we just mm -hmm. couldn't do it with 1,200 baud modems and, and uh, you know, <laughs> that, the, the uh, limited processor speeds that we had. And, and uh, we, we didn't even, you know, there, we didn't know that there was an internet. Um, this was before the web, of course, but there was an internet back then. Um, but we ended up programming all those games to be answered by a computer with multiple modems inside it and the multiple we had multiple phone lines brought into the building and so we didn't even know there were x25 lines and stuff it was it was incredibly <laughs> primitive so. <laughs> so anyway that was larry four was going to be a multiplayer universe game um and of course we were 10 years too early Oh goodness! Wow. That that sounds like it would have been amazing. It sounds like we traded a multiplayer Larry for a random lunch generator. In exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, mate, you're you're an absolute legend. You're a hero of mine, and and I just want to thank you so much for taking all this time to be with us. Well, you're certainly welcome. And if anybody is still awake, which I find hard to believe, um, I, if, if you stayed around this long, you should go to my website, allo.com. Yes. And I have lots and lots of, of information about Sierra in the old days and uh, of funny stories and inside stories of things that happened back then. Uh, and also a heck of a lot of humor, a lot of, of, of ways to laugh, mm -hmm. including a uh, joke database, if you ever need a joke for a special occasion or something you can do a search just like a google search except searching mm -hmm. through all the uh, i think seven thousand jokes uh that i have in there mm -hmm. uh yeah so anyways drop by allo.com follow me on twitter i'm allo one word six letters and uh, um, uh, every weekday morning i'll send you two jokes one of which is clean <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that's mint. Yes, everyone, go go check out Alo's humor site. Sign up at the. You can get your your Cyber Joke three thousand. I believe it's called. I love Cyber that. Joke three thousand. <laughs> <laughs> There's your sound bite, and uh, and everyone out there listening, you can find us on Facebook, uh, the Classic Gamers Guild. We're a page. We're a group. We're on Instagram at cg cggg a bunch of C's and G's <laughs> podcast. Uh, we're on Twitter. Do Thanks, us a Paul. bloody tweet. Yeah. <laughs> Do us a do us a tweeter a tweeter. I sound like Frankenstein's assistant. A tweeter. Do us a tweet right at the CG Guild. Uh, we're on Patreon. Oh, a special thank you to our extra special thanks tier Patreon supporters, Jay Holmes and Mark Fillion. Uh, we love you all. Thank you for listening. And don't do a murder. A collection of crows. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what advice do you have for us, Al? Don't collect crows. That would be <laughs> <laughs>